Good evening, everyone. My name is Khadija Ba, and I am the Communications Officer for ChildLink Inc. Thank you so much for joining us um, on our panel discussion. This evening, we will be discussing parenting styles and their effects on children. Um, with us this evening, we have three esteemed panelists. Uh, Ms. Marcia Smith, founder of Gifted Hands Learning Center for Special Needs. Ms. Kathleen Reed, who is a teacher from Covent Garden Secondary. And we have Reverend Neil Fur Chase, who is the Reverend at North Rumvelt Church of the Nazarene. Before I, uh, before I allow each of them to just introduce themselves a bit further, I just want to share that this panel discussion is part of the Recovery Safeguarding and Reintegration Initiative supported by the delegation of the European Union to Ghana. So Ms. Uh, Ms. Marcia Smith, you can introduce yourselves. Yourself, sorry. Hey everyone, I am Marcia Smith, founder and principal of Gifted Hands Learning Center for Children with Special Needs, and also a mother of four. Kathleen? Hi, good evening everyone and thank you very much for having me here Khadija. Um, as Khadija said, I'm Kathleen Reed. I am a teacher. I've been a teacher for 17 years. I'm also the parent of a 12 year old. Thanks Kathleen. Reverend? Present good evening to you. Thank you Chiling for having us as part of your panel. Uh, I'm Reverend Newford Chase, and I serve as the pastor with leadership responsibility for the North Rumvelt Church of the Nazarene. Uh, I'm a parent of three children, and I'm just excited to be here and be a part of the discussion this evening. Thank you so much to the three of you. I'm just as excited to be here <laughs> to be your host for this evening. Um, like I said, this is a panel discussion, so um, I will ask the same question to each of you. And I hope we have a fruitful and entertaining um, discussion. So the very first question, um, Ms. Smith, if you can start, then we can go to Kathleen and then Reverend Chase. Um, what led you to your specific style of parenting and did your own upbringing impact said parenting? Um, are we having a background music or is it? Me. Oh, no. No, 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 just you. <laughs> just me? Okay. Yeah. Let me take the headphones off. Sure. Uh, good night again. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, for my own parenting lifestyle, uh, life has brought me my own parenting, like uh, my my own upbringing, has taught me so much. I was influenced by my mom, who raised me as a single parent, and it has taught me to do what I know then. When it comes to dealing with my raising my own children. I, I must admit at first, you know, it was pretty hard because uh, I got my first daughter as a young, at a young, very young age. And um, being a parent, a young parent, at first, the, I, like I said, I did what I know best and uh, uh, being, I, I used the, the authoritative parenting skill, but with the, um, like I said, a young mother didn't, you know, try learning to do what I, or doing what I know best, or what I thought it was best then. <laughs> um, but, um, when the other three came along, I changed my parenting skills, my parenting style skills, 
because I saw the negative impacts it had on my first daughter, my first child. Okay. Thank you so much for that, Marcia. Kathleen? Yes. But for me, it, it was mostly trial and error. Um, like Marcia said, she started young. I started young as well. Um, so there wasn't much, there wasn't a lot of um, friends to have spoken with. I haven't had a lot of um, exposure to people around my age that I would have benefited from. So I felt my way along and as I got older and I became more versed in being a parent, um, I would, one of the things that I did, I tried my best to raise my child in a way that um, one of the focus that I had was um, to ensure that people do not have to say to me, well, your son doesn't have manners. That's what I started off with. So as I went along, I found, well, maybe this is not working and this is working and I need to change something and something I need to add and so on. So I that's how I use or that's how I came up with my parenting strategies with regards to whether um, my parents strategies have guided or influenced me um, to an extent they have um, because one of the things that I, that I also tried to do is um, ensure that I avoid doing certain things and ensure that I reinforce certain things. Like for instance, my father would have taught us a lot of um, values, the value of reading and being independent and being assertive and all of these things. So those are some of the things that I took with me and I use those things to help me pattern the way I parent my child. However, there were some things that um, I knew I needed to shield him from as well. So I went along that line. Sounds good. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, Reverend Chase? Sorry. Yes, we learn from patterns. And one of the first influences in my life that would have taught me about parenting would be would have been my mother. Um, that was the initial pattern, the initial foundation. We we learned how to be how to listen. We learned all the, the, the morals that we were supposed to learn about parenting, how to be strict how to be disciplined and all of that begun with my mother. Um, the challenge, however, the challenge, however, is that once I started having children of my own, I recognized that we needed to change. I needed to change. And evolution, and I'm using that word evolution here intentionally, because as you evolve, you begin to recognize things in your life will need to change. You begin to recognize some of the things that you learned as a child is not applicable to how you raise your own children now. And so I believe that time has influenced my approach to parenting now because at every stage of my children's life, I've had to make adjustments 
in order to effectively raise them to be the persons that God wants them to be. Great. <laughs> Thank you so much. And one theme that I'm getting from the, from the three of you um, is that parenting is dynamic. So there, there isn't just one way of doing it. And the way you do it now will not always be, you know, the way that you continue to do it. And more than likely, most times, the way you parent one child will not necessarily be the same way you parent your second child a few years. In. Because as I mentioned, parenting is dynamic and it's pliable and, you know, you need to adapt and change and grow as you, as you and your children grow. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for those responses. Uh, Marcia, second question. Um, what kind of parenting styles do you see within the Guyanese community? Oh, there are four parenting styles. And I say all four. The authoritarian, the authoritative, the passive, and like I said, all four. Where did, where did I where did I stop? I think I I was. Oh, okay. All right, no problem. Um, Kathleen. And as a teacher, I know your um your interactions with parents will be slightly different from uh, the Reverend's interaction, which would be different from Marcia's interaction. So based on your interactions as a teacher, what are some of the parenting styles that you would have seen thus far? Yeah, so what I, uh, what I have observed is that mostly we have the permissive parenting style. Um, well, based on my exposure, right? Um, and also based on the age range of parents, I find younger parents, they are in, they're more in tune to having their children um, more involved in decision making. Um, I don't really see much of a boundary being set. There is this notion that I find where, um, parents and i'm in no way attacking young parents but i have found that um, a lot of parents now are of the opinion or they communicate that they're their they're their children's best friends so we would have people saying oh my daughter is my best friend and my son is my best friend so nothing is wrong with that however what i find lacking is in assuming that your child is your best friend, you now take away your responsibility or some of your responsibility as a parent. So the relationship is a bit, um, I don't want to say challenged, but it's a bit free and open. So the children are now doing as they please and there isn't much consequence or there aren't much consequences because they are allowed to make decisions on their own they're allowed to speak up and nothing is wrong with speaking up but some boundaries are not set and um yeah I've also seen um, a lot of cases where we have the authoritarian parenting style where children are really not allowed to speak, right? So we go over to the other extreme where it's my way. You do what I say and you don't question me because you're the child and I'm the adult. And um, so the children, as an extension, they're not capable of communicating effectively in school or even out of school because they're not allowed to speak. They have the mentality that they should not speak. 
Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Kathleen. Reverend? Uh, I think I've seen in Guyana all four of the parenting styles that uh, Ms. Marcy was talking about. But I want to add a different dynamics to it. I think sometimes we have to take into consideration ethnicity. Um, because I grew up with a mother who was authoritative. She wanted her children to, to be responsible. So she taught us how to be responsible. But I've also seen in the community I grew up in South Georgetown, the permissive where parents refuse to become involved. I hear the complaints even now. Uh, I have a friend who is working uh, in East Romville with children and she talks about the fact that the parents are permissive. They're unwill they're, they there's an unwillingness to enforce rules. And then she talks about children being on the parents being uninvolved. Uh, they just leave their children to do as they feel like doing. So I, I, when I look at these different styles in Ghana, I think we see all of the styles, but I add the ethnic considerations to it because in different communities, you'll see different things. In some communities, you'll see them starting with the authoritative or the authoritarian, while in some other communities, you'll see them starting with the permissive and the uninvolved. Particularly too, if you are the first child, the first child, you know, the child who everybody fusses about, they tend to be that permissive style of parenting, where as we like to say again, you become the spoiled child um, because you get away with things that the other children after you wouldn't get away with. And as I look back at my own life, my own, um, my own upbringing, I begin to recognize that those are some things I've had to watch because I'm the first child. And the first child is usually the experimental child. Sorry, ladies but that, and, and parents, but that's the reality. Um, that's the child you don't want to go in any mud. That's the child you don't want. Uh, you think that child, if somebody touched that child, is going to break. You know, that's the child that you are testing everything out on and your knowledge out on. And usually in that process, there is that permissive approach to parenting. So that child gets to do some things. You know, I, I have brothers and sisters and when you look back, you say, but you got away with some things that we didn't get away with. And that's because I was the first child. All right. So, and, and so you, you, you have all of those styles operating in Guyana. Uh, again, in South Georgetown, where I grew up, you saw a lot of the authoritative and the authoritarian. Uh, approach to parenting. We are in control. Uh, we heard things like, do as I say and not as I do. Little children must be seen and not heard. When we tell you do something, there's no questions asked. We grew up with that kind of, in, in those kinds of situations, with that kind of experience. So for me, when I think of Guyana, I see all of these styles at work in Guyana. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do any of you two ladies have on. a response? Yes. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, Pastor, uh, you said the first child gets away with murder, but in my own, my children, they say to my last son, you get away with murder. This is the last one. He came 10 years after. So, um, and he, well, I was clearly saying he is the experiment. <laughs> I think it varies, but for the most part, you see it with the first child. Um, the, the first child generally, I was telling my mother the other day because she put a post on Facebook and I said, the first child is always the superstar. The one you experiment with and then that's the one you put out there. And then everybody else that comes after get the, the kind of treatment. I'm not even sure if I can explain it right, but it's like the kind of treatment get what to them. You know, when the first child bruise the foot, everybody's there. You bruise your foot for the first time, you get a plaster. And then when the second child comes, you do get up from them and you could make it. And, and, and you know, <laughs> we've already done that with the first child. We ain't got the time to cry over bruise. You know, the first child get the bruise. Oh, come the mommy, kiss it. Come the auntie, kiss it. Come this person, kiss it. And by the second child is, listen, get a plaster and get some meth. It is spiritual. And, and, you, and you're gone. 
<laughs> so so when I look at the parenting style, I've seen all of that in, in my own life. And I think we have seen all of that in Guyana as well. Yes, that is so true. And another thing, um, like Pastor said, this notion of children should be seen and not heard. Um, I can remember that very well because growing up, whenever we have a visitor coming over, our place was in the bedroom before the visitor gets to the steps. We would go into the bedroom and that prompted us to peep through the creases and to listen in on the conversations and so on, right? So, um, yeah, that's true. <laughs> it, the look, it's an interesting the look journey. From it's parents, an interesting journey. The look from your mother alone sent you away. <laughs> and and that, that has to do with the authoritarian style of parenting. Um, you know, I was reading a post, the other person said, my mother never said anything. She just looked, you know, yeah. and, and when you got that look, um, the eyes and the face said everything. Um, you knew that it is time to disappear. Um, <laughs> you knew uh, if you try even to get into a conversation when the adults are talk were talking and, and you got that look, you know, as soon as you start shaping up, there's that look, you know, all right, this is my cue to disappear. <laughs> and the thing about that is, uh, that's disappear for them. But when the visit is gone, you got to come back and get your sorting out because you thought you were a big man. You thought this was a big people con. <laughs> you were old enough to be involved in this conversation. And, and so it taught you some things. It taught you about respect. It taught you about values. Now, Times have changed. There has been an evolution in time. And one of the things that we, I'm recognizing now as a parent is that the authoritative approach that we had is not working as much now. We've got yeah. to add a new style of parenting, which is more about empowering our children. This is Generation X. They have access to more information than we have ever had access to. And because they have access to that information, we can no longer just operate with the authoritative style, which is, listen, I'm telling you this and this is the, the solution or this is the way to go. They can now go to the internet. They can now Google it and they can tell you, no, that's not how it is supposed to be done. As such, we've got to become more experienced as people who are empowering our children to ask the hard questions, to, to ask the kind of questions that can help them to grow. It is something we may be unwilling to do but it is a reality. They're coming to us younger and they're asking the harder questions that at 18, when I was 18, I probably didn't even want to ask my mother. I probably went on the street and hear the boys talking some things, but they're asking you now. And so we've got to get to that place like it's because evolution is taking place, times are changing. And so we've got to change and adjust our styles as well. Thank you so much for that, uh, Reverend Chase, Marcia, and Kathleen. Uh, we will now move on to the third question. What are the effects or impacts of your parenting style on your child or children? You can start with Marcia again. Um, well, the, my first three, like I said, they're all young adults. And the oldest often say to me, Mommy, you were really harsh on me. You allowed the other three to get away with murder. Which in sometimes I I accept. But um because of my last son, the well the, the, I would say they're young adults. My last son, he is 15 and he is on the autism spectrum. So parenting him with all four the parenting skills, with everything that I, I've learned about parenting, you know, I, 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 I wouldn't say that um, 
I have, I'm the best parent, or, you know, I'm still trying because with him, it's trial and error. And like pastor said just now, you know, sometimes he comes with the hardest question for me. And sometimes he comes with 50 questions. And I often say, Jared, you know, I don't have all the answers to life's questions. He said, but I Googled it. So <laughs> how you don't know? <laughs> there is Google mommy. And I pause because from a child not talking for seven years of his life. Wow. And now having to hear all these questions, because if he has a question, he comes with it. One, two, three. It's either I grasp it or I let it go. It's not as it's not a walk in the park with him. He has taught me so much. He has taught me patience. He has taught me how to love unconditionally in spite of. He has taught me, he said, we're still walking. We're still taking it step by step. But like I said, yes. you know, when the questions come and then he comes back and said, I Google it. Um, <laughs> could you just tell me what you Google? What you came up with? Because, sorry, mommy don't know. I give up. I give up. <laughs> Many days I just say I give up. Take it, Jared. Take it. Run with it. Because uh, he have the good communication, his head teacher. So he told her, I wasn't aware of the conversation. He said, um, he started being at home. So she's, she messaged me one night and she said, I and Jared had a long conversation. I wasn't aware. But she said she spoke with him as the head teacher. This is the child who I never heard his voice for seven years. This is the child that the doctor said to me, he will never ride a bike. He will never know me. He will never do anything. So, you know, when I look back, there is a God. I'm not going to get religious here. Um, but sometimes we have to, me personally, go before God and say thanks. Um, it's not a point of judging myself. You know, I reached the place, I said, okay, I don't care who look at his twerks, who looks at him funny, who, whatever. He's my child. And I will continue to try to raise him to the best of my knowledge, along with the help of God, you know, mm -hmm. because it's not easy raising the generation X in this society. I can tell you that he's 15, looking for a role model. And, you know, he comes to me. Um, so what are we doing? We said yes said I don't understand what are we doing he said we because it's you and I you know we go go to church together we eat together so he don't ever ask where is his father so it's just us he says sometimes he come, come let me give you a hug spontaneously I know, I know you, um, I know you're lonely. It's like, how, how do you know all of this? <laughs> how do you know all of this? He said, um, yeah, I know. I was Googling something. Like, what? <laughs> but yeah. he is my lifeline. Yeah. Um, you will hear more about First, Jared. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> I look forward yeah, to it. hear more and more about Jared. I, 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 I'm good. I have to give some time to Pastor and <laughs> Kathleen. <laughs> you know, but um, Jared, yeah, Kathleen, Jared, we're still going it step by step. 
we are still I'm still learning I I'm prepared to walk I'm prepared to walk the walk because of Jared Great, thanks I am now the founder and principal of gifted hands because of him being on the autism spectrum he's my tour guide into special education needs Can I can I jump and in? That's where we um, love and and, and big up sure. Miss Marcy. Sure. Um mm -hmm. and I'm bigging her up because I know some people and some children who've come through her hands. I know uh Sister Yulin Gobin would want to say hi to you for the work you've done with uh Nehemiah. Nehemiah. I know that Miss Yvonne Harry would also want to usually celebrates you for the work you've done with AJ, with Hess. Uh, so I know you've done excellent work with special needs. So I big you up for that. I hear your name a lot in my circles. <laughs> so uh, excellent job. See, small world. Um, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I just want to add though, because I heard her, I heard Miss Marcy say something. She says the Generation X is difficult is a challenge to parent generation X. I don't think it's a challenge. Um, I, I think where it becomes a difficulty is because we hold on just to what we have learned over the years. And we are not willing to let go of some of the things we have learned. I ha as a parent have to, pa <laughs> have to parent three generation X and they will ask, the hardest questions, they will do the things that will challenge you to make adjustments. And so the question may be, what impact? I think for me, one of the things about parenting now is helping them to be confident, um, helping them to know that they possess what it takes to make a difference in the world. When I grew up, I wasn't told I needed to be confident. I wasn't taught I needed to be confident. It was just assumed that based on where you came from, you were confident. And I think that is what messes with a lot of children today. Um, we have to encourage them to be confident. We have to empower them as well to be themselves. We have to empower them to be themselves. The Bible says, and I'm a pastor, so I've got to go there. This is my source book. Um, of course. I can never <laughs> have a discussion and not go to my source book. The Bible says to us in Proverbs 22 and verse 6, train up a child in the way that they should go so that when they are old they will not depart and a lot of times when we look at that particular text and think about training children we just think about transmitting information we just think about morals and values but when you read the text a little bit different from an, from the amplified version it says this train up a child in the way he should go and in keeping with his individual gift or bent and i like that part because it says to me that the way I impact the life of the child is to help the child to live out what God, help the child to develop what God has deposited in them. And that's why there's no stupid child, there's no dunce child, these, you know, these terms that you hear and parents say, it's better to make a donkey, that's the nice way of putting it, better to make a donkey than you. You know, you, you have to figure out who the child is recognize who the child is and nurture that and so for me as a parent that's one of the things and that's one of the ways i said about to impact my children's life to nurture what is on the inside of them it is fun because i have a daughter who wants to be a doctor i have a son who wants to be a, a, a mechanical engineer i have a son who wants to be a computer engineer and he takes the phones and the computers and he finds all manner of things he can do with it and, and, and so you've got to, you know, when, you, when you're at that place, working with children and understanding their gifts and their abilities, how you empower them is going to be important. What you tell them, how you nurture them. You know, back in the day, um, you wanted to be a technician. You go throw your mother TV, you would have had some lashes across your back. <laughs> Who tell you go and trouble my TV? There's, you know, right. now we've got to learn Go buy a cheap TV and say, brother, open up and see what you could see, see what you could do in it. Go buy an old computer, do your thing. You know, uh, my, my son says, I want to build a car. So I know by the time my car gets old enough, he's going to get it because he's going to want to experiment and change the engine. 
you know, these are things that we've got to learn now as parents. And we can't say, well, you got to wait. You know, um, we buy, uh, <laughs> you know, we buy remote control cars for the kids. And I found out that if I buy remote control cars at Christmas time, years ago, within two days, the car was opened up and people checking to see what's inside. You know, because that is where they're at. And so we've got to, it's not a challenge. We've got to make the adjustments as the parents so that we can right. help them become all that they should be. And that's the great thing um, about being aware as parents is um, also because it's not just, yes, that's a child and, you know, the child has to fit into my mold, but for you to be aware and to be conscious of your role and um, just how much your choices and decisions impact your child, you can then mm -hmm. allow for more uh, individuality and creativity and, you know, just more development of their uh, so thank you. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, sure. Before we go. One of the things that we've done as a society is we've used one measurement for every single child. Correct. Uh, my parents did that, oh, and many of other parents do that. It is a single measurement for every single child. We want you to let's let's look at it from an education perspective. We want you to go to school. We want you to write ten subjects CXC. We want you to be a doctor. If you're not a doctor, a lawyer, you fail. I'm recognizing now, and, and years ago I started talking about this, in terms of education, we've got to do some things differently in Guyana when it comes to education. We should begin to stream our children, not when they're coming out of secondary school. We should begin to stream them since primary school because they show a disposition for a particular thing. Your son might show a disposition for fixing things and we're waving, we, we, we forcing them to learn maths, English, social studies, and science because that's the measurement. And it's a wrong measurement because not everybody is going to be able to do that. We've got to teach the children to be successful in their individual giftedness. And if we do that, we will see many more geniuses emerging. We will see many more innovative things happening in our society. As parents, we've got to learn that too. Because if we don't do it at home, then what we do is continue the mill. And then when we see the delinquents on the road and the dropouts, we complain, but we don't recognize that we're continuing the mill of using a measurement that is incorrect to say everybody needs to adopt to this standard. And so I have a difficulty when I see the Ministry of Education every year say, oh, this is the top students in the country because they got 20 CXE. Hold up, hold up. That may be a student who is gifted in that way, but there's a young man who could build a car if you give him a chance. There, if you if you had worked with him that same five years or six years, you would have probably had a new model of car. Ghana could have, could have probably been producing something innovative, but we miss that simply because we use the wrong measurement across the board. Thank you so much, Reverend. Um, Kathleen, as an educator, would you like to respond to um, what Reverend Chase said? Ed, as well as answer the question. Yeah, but before I do, I wanted to say, um, Marcia, I do not know you, but listening to you speak, I can tell that you're a wonderful mother. And I, I know that you are going to be okay and your children are going to be okay. Mm -hmm. um, with regards to responding, um, <laughs> What I can say is this pandemic has forced us to acknowledge some deficiencies and to implement new measures and new methods that we can use to work with our students. And I am confident that we're going to do better. I'm confident that we are going to have an innovative education system that will cater for all of our students and all of their different needs and so on. I'm confident of that. Um, with regards to how effective my parenting is, um, listen, it doesn't always work. My parenting style isn't always effective. So, I would find myself 
having to deal with a child who would go behind my back and do things because whatever measure of discipline I would have used for a particular situation was not um, it's not what he would have wanted or the results would have not been in tune with what he would have expected so um, I find I encounter rebellion I encounter um, sneaking around behind my back one in two times I encounter dishonesty however one of the things that I'm very proud of is that he recognizes when he's wrong so even if he's upset and he goes behind my back and he does something eventually he comes and he apologizes so um while i'm still working out my methods and trying to use the best methods um i am happy that he has in him the ability to acknowledge when he is wrong and to apologize for when he is wrong even though sometimes he feels the need to challenge me right um I needed to comment on something else, but I, I lost my train of thought. At some point during the discussion, as soon as I remember, I will, because it was important. Sure, <laughs> sure no problem. Yeah. No problem. Okay, um, so the penultimate question is, could all of you, well, each of you, um, give an example of how you think your child or children have benefited from your parenting? Hmm. <laughs> Mars is going first. Uh, you go first. Yes. Faster. Okay. Faster goes first. I think for me, I think for me, the children will have to answer that question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and the reason I say that is in our house we can be fun they they have the 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 there's the openness that you can come and talk to us i think that's one of the benefits that they have that you can come and talk to us i think the other benefit is we create an environment that makes you comfortable um and i think that has worked because it minimizes instances of dishonesty you can come and actually talk um, and I think that's a benefit. Given that I grew up in an environment where I couldn't really ask some questions, I couldn't really say some things, you know, um, you had some things on your mind that you had to keep on the inside. Um, and I, I purpose in my heart as a prince, I'm not going to repeat some of those things. I want them to be free, to be open, um, to be able to have dialogue. I have to commend my wife because she does a great job with them when it comes to having conversations and dialoguing because I think that's a benefit. Um, the other thing for me that I think is a benefit is helping them to understand their value. All right? They need to understand their value. You're not going out into the world um, to, to just make mistakes. Let me let me use the example. My daughter was helping my son, and is helping my son who's preparing for CXE uh, a little bit later this year. And in one of those instances, he was not really focusing on what she needed to do. And she said for him this: She said, "You need to remember what Daddy said. Daddy said, basically, if you get an education, the world is your play field." And she went on to say, "There's no Plan B in life. You work Plan A." until you accomplish planning. And I thought, wow, as a parent, I need to take a step back here because she's repeating some of the same things I've been saying. But it speaks of the impact you've had on their life when they begin to recognize, I've got to work my skill, my individual passion. I've got to work it until it become a reality. And I think that for me is a benefit that they know that they can accomplish what they set out to accomplish once they put their mind and heart to it. Yes, thank you, Reverend. That, that's very important. 
um, Kathleen or Marcia? Um, yeah, for me, exactly. well, one of the one of the things that um, I think I have mentioned mentioned it just now, um, with him apologizing and you know being able to recognize when he did something that is inappropriate or was inappropriate. So another thing, um, and Pastor is very correct, right? It's important for us to teach them, um values and responsibility and accountability and that's one of the things that works with me and my child right because if he understands that if he doesn't do his homework he has to deal with the consequences if he does not revise he is not going to be successful in his test so one of the things that I would do, I, you know, we tend to tell our children, we want to build them up, right? So we tell them, you can do all things, you, you can be whatever you want to be, you are going to be successful. But I think one of the things that we fail with is that we don't attach um, a consequence or a prerequisite sorry so if we're telling them you are going to be successful I think somewhere there we need to attach if you make the effort right so we don't want to teach them that have them think that I'm going to be successful no matter what I'm going to be successful if I work hard if I'm disciplined if I take um, responsibility for my work if I am accountable um, if I fulfill whatever it is that I need to do to be successful because um, you might find them lying in the couch all day oh mommy says that I'm going to be successful so I'll be successful right so um, in terms of accountability he I let him face the consequences of his actions. If he's told to do something and he doesn't, well then he deals with the consequences. So in a, in a way, in most of the times, because sometimes he still slips up, but most of the times I would find that he tries to do what he has to do to avoid the consequences, especially if they're negative consequences. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Marcia? Yeah, um, like Pastor said, my children will have to see what kind of parent I am. But um, <laughs> I still believe at some point that I am a firm parent, you know, because I, it's not that like I spoiled them, no, but I, I let them, you know, be responsible for their actions. And if they do something that I'm not pleased with, I give an explanation and I said, this is the reason why I am taking this action because you were not very nice. You did not cooperate with me. So I think my parenting style, I would say, has caught you know caused my children to be contented respectful and considerate mm. for each other and everyone around them. that's all i have to say Excellent. <laughs> also if i may another thing mm -hmm. with teaching our children to be bold and to be confident right while i completely agree with that one of the experiences that i would have sometimes is um you know when we were younger and your mother would come to you and ask you um when are you going to go and water the plants right she really isn't expecting you to say um when I'm finished, right? 
just now. As soon as she comes to you with, when are you going to go and water the plants? You know supposed to be now. <laughs> you need to get up and to move and water the plants immediately. All right. So now we have the challenge where if you say, when are you going to go and water the plants? The child assumes that he or she could respond, I will go just now or in an hour, right? So while teaching them to be confident and to be able to speak boldly, we have to also take into consideration that, you know, they might literally speak boldly. <laughs> can, can I jump in a little bit here? Because I agree with, with, with Kathleen. I agree with Kathleen. But I think part of our thing is our fear. We are not prepared for the answer. And I think that, and that's what our parents taught us. When I say move, you move. Um, now you have a generation that says, I'm going to move, but... I may be doing something else. I'm not ready to move yet. How do we deal with that as parents? And I know when we're dealing with the authoritative style of parenting, our first thing is to say, I say move. But in this generation, and when we're talking about Generation X, I say move is not a good enough answer. I say move sounds good in my head, but it doesn't sound right for them because you have to give a qualifying reason and that is something we were not thought as parents to give the qualifying reason then this is why you move you need to get this done now so that you can move on to something else a little bit later on we don't say those things we go back to i don't i just tell you move so when i tell you move move and and that becomes problematic many a times and that's why there is so much confrontation when we're talking about raising generation x because we were not raised to provide answers uh we couldn't ask i couldn't ask my mother when she said go bring a bucket of water um you want it now that men go bring it now <laughs> um it's a different generation it's a different time and we have got to make the adjustments all right while i'm on that too i want to ask another question just maybe for the viewers to think about it. What exactly is success when it comes to our children? And what exactly is failure? And it's an important question to answer because if you are comparing your child with the neighbor next door, or you're comparing your children to what you have accomplished, then more than likely you may think that they are failures because they didn't get what you wanted or what you, Yes, sir. What what you would think they need. All right. So we've got to really sit down and look at how we define success and how we define failure. Thank you so much for that question and that contribution, Reverend Chase. Actually, so we have a few minutes more. So what I think we can do, um, Marcia and Kathleen, uh, would you guys like to answer Reverend Chase's question? I think we should leave um, there for another yeah. time. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but you know, as Pastor was saying just now, the challenge with Generation X, well, I can only say, safely speak, speak for Jared. You know, if last night I said to him, he loves to cook, you know, I taught him to be independent, I taught him to be self sufficient. So I said, when well, once you're finished cooking, wash your wheels mommy please tell me why right please tell me why i said right. because you you found them clean <laughs> okay but when i'm finished eating do i have to wash it right away yes <laughs> i just have to be firm really really firm or else he comes with another question and a question and and every there is a why. Tell me why. Right. So I said, yeah. the discussion is finished. Wash 
your ears. <laughs> I'm finished. You know, being firm, I really have to be firm because he's the last, he's the tallest every day. He wants to know how tall he is. So he feels that now I have to look up to him. So he is this tall child, very tall child. And, you know, he can walk away and breathe. That's all he can do, walk away and breathe. But at the end of the day, you must respect my right. role. And he knows that. So, uh, you know, not being his friend, but at the same time, let him know I am still the parent. Um, Kathleen? Yes, I agree with that. Letting them know that you are the parent. So while you allow them to have their opinions or to have an input every now and again, we have to make sure that we maintain certain boundaries. And um, comparing your child to, your, to the neighbor's child and so on, um, it, I don't think, um, I don't know that a lot of parents would do that. But one of the things that we need to focus on as in terms of um, success for our children, right? We need to teach them to be disciplined, to be accountable, and to be responsible. And I've mentioned these three things before, right? Once um, they have established these three very important things, right? They're on the path to success. And the, the thing age appropriate in, in terms of being disciplined, in terms of being responsible and accountable and so on, we need to apply age, age appropriate um, responsibilities and so on, right? So we're not going to put our 10 year old daughter and tell her, oh, you need to go and cook the lunch and cook the dinner and clean up and take care of the siblings because I'm teaching you to right. be responsible. But at 10 years old, we need to be teaching her to shower herself completely and well and to, you know, do things that are age appropriate. So as they get older, we increase the responsibility and accountability and discipline. And discipline involves simple things like do your homework, pick up your clothes, you know, these things. And when we teach them these small values, as they get older, we increase them and they'll be fine. They will be fine. Um, Thank you so much, Kathleen. Just let me a little on your age, sure. the age related. Because, of, because, of, because I work with children with special, special education needs or special needs, um, when it comes to their cognitive and their, their chronological age and their cognitive ability, you know, that's where, oh, that's where <laughs> I tend to say, okay, let's take it step by step. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, all three of you. On that note, um, I would like to thank everyone for joining us this evening for this panel discussion on parenting styles and their effects on children. I am Khadija Ba. I'm the Communications Officer for ChildLink Inc. We have with us Ms. Marcia Smith, who is the founder of Gifted Hands Learning Center for Special Needs, Ms. Kathleen Reed, who is a teacher at Covent Garden Secondary, and Reverend Neil Ferd Chase, who is the Reverend at North Ramvelt Church of the Nazarene. And this was a panel discussion which was part of the Recovery, Safeguarding, and Reintegration Initiative supported by the delegation of the European Union to Ghana. Thank you everyone for being with us and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you for good having evening us. To you.